I always remember when I did not understand how I used to stand under all the fools' rules running these lands. I had my head in the sand and I was asleep. Now I learn a little more every day and I'm waking the sheep. Gonna say it out loud, say it proud, get it out Cause I'm burning inside, cannot hide it no more I'm a rat on too Yeah, I'm a rat on too Oh, I'm a rat on too Oh, the people in the chat room singing Oh, I'm a rat on too One more time, one more time now Good evening and uh, welcome to Raconteurs 2. This is Jason Holmes started standing in for Aid Hardy and uh, just reminding everybody that this world is for everybody and not just for Aid Hardy. Aid will be back in a couple of weeks. Um, I've been away. Uh, Aid's, I've just got a postcard from him. He's in Thailand. He's having a a wonderful time by the sounds of it, sampling the delights over there. Uh, not too many delights, I hope, and uh, no dangly delights. <laughs> but, uh, you know, he's over in Thailand and he'll be back, back on the show, I'm sure, raring to go in a couple of couple of weeks' time. But tonight we have got, a, we've got a, a limited amount of time. We've only got an hour with our guests tonight. So we, this is going to be a short show, Raconteurs 2. So uh, what I want to do is I want to get straight into it. It's uh, September the 11th today, which means it's 16 years since uh, that terrible day in New York and Pennsylvania and uh, Washington. Um, all those years ago, we don't need to say anything about it. Everybody that's listening to this, I'm absolutely positive knows all about all the information, all the theories, um, and, and I don't think there's anybody that b actually believes uh, the official story anymore. So, with it being 9-11, uh, we've got a very special guest tonight. Um, I'd like to introduce, welcome back to Raconteurs 2. In fact, he, he was on Raconteurs News before, but uh, welcome to Raconteurs 2. Um, he's a DJ, a music journalist. He's also written uh, written a book. He's got another book coming out. I think he said in January, which we're going to have him back for that. But we, I thought we'd uh, perhaps get into some of the symbolism and uh, that was prior to 9/11 in the music industry. And who better to do that with than uh, Mark Devlin? Mark, how are you doing? Jason, good to be back, man, on this dubious occasion. Yeah, it is. Uh, it is a bit dubious, isn't it? I mean, uh, well, how how's things with you? Just gives a how, how are things around you at the moment? What's uh, what's your feelings? And are you doing much work? Well, yeah, I'm finishing off my second book, as you just mentioned there, Musical Truth Volume Two. I'm aiming to get that out early in the new year. So, I'm just at the finishing stages, I've got two more chapters to write, and then the proofreading and the typeset in and the book cover design all begins but i've been quite busy on that that's tied me up all year really so wow. i put out musical truth last year and i realized that it really only told part of the story that needs to be told even though it was 170,000 words over 536 pages there's still much more to the story so uh, yeah that's coming soon and other than that just keeping busy with my podcasts I've had to re-upload all my audio onto Spreaker, which I know you guys use, when SoundCloud dumped me a few months ago. Uh, so I've been busy putting all that onto my new Spreaker account. And then, you know, holding down all the regular stuff in life has kept me fairly busy, actually. Yeah, it, uh, it generally tends to do that, doesn't it, when you've got, to, you've, got I mean, you've got so many irons in the fire. You do your podcast as well, don't you? The Sound of Now and uh, Good Vibrations. Is that, they, those are your podcasts, aren't they? I'm sorry for my ignorance. Yeah, they are. Uh, good Vibrations is the conversation-based one. The Sound of Freedom is the conscious music. I also do a normal, in inverted commas, radio show where I actually just play straight music and don't get into conspiratorial stuff believe it or not so I, I do that on an fm station in oxford on saturday and that just kind of reminds me that i used to be a dj before i got into all this truthing lark and it kind of keeps me grounded so i have to find the time for that as well 
Yeah, well, it's it's always interesting. I used to be a DJ. I don't know if you remember from last time, but I spent 25 years uh, as a as a nightclub DJ, and I only had to I had to retire in 2013. So uh, it, right. you know, we should uh, DJs are notorious for uh, not liking each other, but I'm sure we can get on for uh, for for this hour, and uh, we can discuss some of the things. Out. Let's first of all. There's a huge amount of symbolism before the event, wasn't there, um, in in music? Can you give some examples of that, you know, uh, of di- different things that were in music? I know there was a Supertramp thing from quite a long time ago, an album cover from Supertramp, I think, that that uh, demonstrated, uh, that, that had a profound effect after the event. Um, it, it was, you know, you could see what what they were trying to what they were trying to tell us, and they've got this habit, aren't they? I, I wanted to tell us what what they're going to be doing beforehand. Well, absolutely, yeah, and we can get into the super tramp, which is probably the best example we've got of nine eleven predictive programming in music. Let me just preface that by saying these anniversaries are useful. I feel in reminding us that there are still folk out there that unfortunately have not cottoned on to the fact that 9-11 was an inside job. I know you mentioned at the top of the show that certainly anyone listening to this uh, has got wise to the truth of that matter. But things like being in the queue at school to pick your kids up and hearing the other mums talking or being in a supermarket queue or hearing a couple of guys chatting down the pub, something like that, you do still hear people from regular walks of life saying things like, oh, 9-11, wasn't that awful? Those bloody Muslims, you know, these Islamic terrorists, why don't they just leave us alone? And it does remind you that there are unfortunately people out there still that need that wake-up call to uh, the truth of, of this whole thing. And I think if only if we only move in similar s- social circles to ourselves, so we only surround ourselves with other truth-seekers, then we can often think that, oh, well, everyone in the world now understands that 9-11 was an inside job. And I think you've got to get out into regular walks of life and and just uh, hear what people are talking about there to keep things in context. So uh, a good way, I feel, to get through to people and communicate the fact that 9-11 was an inside job and that it was pulled off by various expressions of the government and the establishment that we have, the ruling classes, is to get into this whole thing about predictive programming. Because, as you mentioned, there are so many examples of aspects of the events of September 11th, 2001, that were encoded, some of them blatantly, some of them quite subtly, into album sleeves, promotional pictures, music videos, Hollywood movies, cartoons even. And we can certainly look at some of those examples. So if you're someone that is going to chalk this all up as random and coincidence, then I really don't know what to say to you, to be honest. Mm. When, when you look at the number of examples that there are, the chances of all these aspects of 9-11 being encoded into these works of popular culture by accident or just as one of those things are probably akin to what I'm going to have for my dinner tomorrow night being encoded into Hollywood movies and cartoons and stuff. You know, the odds are roughly the same if you're going to chalk it up as randomness. It's quite clearly not random. And the only way it can be explained is if the agencies or the parties that actually pulled 9-11 off are in some way complicit and working in conjunction with the parties that put out these albums and these Hollywood movies and these music videos and stuff. There's no other way to rationally explain it for any sane, critically minded thinker, I would suggest. And at the centre of that, sorry, Mark, at the centre of that, The Simpsons seems to be really, really heavily uh, into the predictive programming stuff. There's so many examples from, from 9-11 to, to Trump and, and things like that. You know, it, it, it just doesn't, it doesn't add up that it's a coincidence. Absolutely. And The Simpsons have got previous, you know, when it comes to predictive programming relating to uh, so-called false flag terror events and... Uh, you know, things like Sandy Hook and stuff like that. The Simpsons have got previous in terms of uh, there definitely being some inside knowledge. And Matt Groening, the creator of The Simpsons, is a, I think, 33rd degree Freemason. He's certainly a Freemason, which tells you a lot. 
<laughs> Freemasonry is never far from the surface in these stories. But yeah, when it comes to cartoons and movies and things like that, you've got Terminator, Die Hard, The Matrix, Independence Day, no end of examples where uh, aspects of 9-11 were encoded. But we can look at some from the music industry and probably a good place to start is the Super Tramp album sleeve that you just mentioned. Yep. So Super Tramp were a British sort of adult orientated rock band and they put out this album breakfast in america in 1979 and on the sleeve you've got an image looking out from an airplane window coming in over the manhattan skyline and you've got the word super tramp emblazoned across the sky you've got this waitress kind of taking the pose of the statue of liberty holding up a glass of orange juice and a menu and uh you know it seems innocent and straightforward enough until you do a mirror image reversal of the sleeve and this is important because satanic inversion is one of the major tenets and kind of calling cards of this elite ruling class that we've got who when you get down to the, the grassroots of it all are dark occult practitioners they take they um uh, put out rituals and uh, ceremonial magic depictions and stuff in, in what they do. Uh, this occult religion that they've got is very important to their belief system. So it doesn't matter whether we buy into it or not or think there's any validity to it or not. They clearly do. And it dictates the things that uh, they manifest. So if you do a mirror image reversal of this sleeve, then something very interesting happens. So where you had the U and the P of Supertramp in the regular image, when you render it in reverse, it suddenly becomes a 9 and an 11. And you see these figures above the twin towers of the World Trade Center in the Manhattan skyline. And a couple of other things to bear in mind are that... We'll see. The events of 9-11... To... favourite show. Something's going on there. I don't know what that was. Is that you, Andy? Very strange. Our producer, I guess... Yeah, sorry, that was me. I uh, opened a tab by mistake. Okay. <laughs> well, yes, carry on, uh, carry on, Mark. Sorry about our producer there. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, these events took place round about breakfast time, of course, in the morning of 9-11. And here we have an album called Breakfast in America. And also it's a view from the aeroplane window on this particular sleeve. Uh, so that kind of speaks for itself. That's a pretty good example. Uh, another one I would point to is an album called Party Music that was put out there by a little known rap group. They weren't really that well known beforehand and they've certainly not been heard of since called The Coup. And uh, this was released in June 2001. And on the sleeve to it, the original sleeve design has the two members of the group stood in front of the Twin Towers of the World Trade Center. And they're exploding in exactly the same way as we saw happen on that day. And one of the group members, Boots Riley, is holding a detonating device. And he's evidently just pressed the button on it to detonate this explosion. So, you know, what are the chances of that happening randomly uh, as well? And there was an interview with this group after the events of September 11th went off. Uh, a few people cottoned on to the fact that they put this album sleeve out. And so this guy, Boots Riley, was interviewed and they said, well, you know, how did you come to uh, settle on this album sleeve? And he made some lame-ass excuse like, oh, it was de a demonstration against American capitalism. I just wanted to make a statement about destroying American capitalism. It wasn't very convincing. And the group was kind of forced to put out an alternative sleeve to that album directly afterwards because it was con considered to be in poor taste. Cool. So that's another one that we've got. We can go back to 1997 when Michael Jackson put out his album Blood on the Dance Floor. And that's interesting in so many ways, particularly when you factor in Freemasonry, as I mentioned earlier. You've got him dancing on a black and white checkerboard floor of the type that you see in Masonic temples and depicting the black and white duality that uh, is addressed in occult mystery schools and stuff. It relates to base consciousness and you're said to be on the board in Freemasonry. It's, it's a reference to absolute base consciousness, which the regular masses of humanity are kept in deliberately in spiritual ignorance. So that's what's being symbolized there. You've got Michael Jackson in a blood red suit 
so that's one of the colours of Saturn, associated with Saturn, which is very important to the belief systems of these occult practitioners. And so he's dancing around. Oh, and blood on the dance floor is also also pertains to um, you know ritual sacrifices as well in some of these occult traditions. So he's dancing in front of a skyline which is crumbling to dust, evidently in some sort of destruction. And it looks very similar to the Manhattan skyline. So it appears to be another depiction of what's going to happen on 9-11. And somebody pointed out to me after I first presented this sleeve in a public talk that if you look at the way Michael Jackson is holding his hands in that picture, and if you superimpose the positions of his arms onto a clock face, one of his arms is pointing at a nine and one of his arms is pointing at where the 11 would be. So that seems to be another rendering of 9-11. We can go back to December 1998, and this one involves Prince, very interesting artist to get into, as was Michael Jackson, of course, who both met the same fate, similar fates, uh, both born in 1958 in the Midwest section of the US as well, and uh, lots of contemporary links between their respective careers. But anyway, Prince performed this concert in Utrecht in the Netherlands in December 1998. And you can get the footage of this on YouTube, or at least the audio. Uh, so you can listen to this for yourself and judge what it is that's going on. At one point towards the end of the concert, he says, we're going to do one more. I've got one more song, then I've got to go. And I'm paraphrasing here, but he says something along the lines of, I've got to get back to America. Uh, Osama bin Laden's getting ready to bomb. Osama bin Laden's getting ready to bomb. He repeats it. Mm. Uh, and then directly afterwards, he says, 2001 hit me. So this was, you know, just under three years before the events of September 11th. And there appears to be some foreknowledge on the part of Prince as to what is to come and the fact that it's going to be pinned on Osama bin Laden. How else do you explain those comments? You know, even if you chalk his reference to Osama bin Laden up as some random throwaway comment, given that bin Laden was already public enemy number one in the US in 1998, how do you then explain the comment 2001 hit me coming straight afterwards? Mm. So, you know, there's been lots of speculation on what it was that led to the death of Prince last year, certainly among those people that don't buy the official story that he just happened to collapse of some sort of pharmaceutical medication overdose in an elevator, you know, the way you do when you're 57 and a vegan and in good health. <laughs> you know, when, when you start looking into possible motives for some kind of ritual takeout of prints, then you go to some very interesting places. You know, he was talking in that famous Tavis Smiley TV interview about chemtrails, which celebrities are not really supposed to do when they're sticking to the script that's laid out for them. And certainly seems to have had some foreknowledge of what was planned for 9-11 back in 1998. It's a very bizarre thing. So we got some others. Uh, Jay-Z put out one of his very famous iconic albums called The Blueprint, the original Blueprint album, on the 11th of September 2001. That just happened to be the release date of it. Oh. And then the following year, he put out the follow-up, The Blueprint 2, The Gift and the Curse, which was released on the 12th of November 2002. And this date just happened to be the day that a video of Osama bin Laden is said to have been discovered, I think, by that organisation known as SITE, run by Rita Katz, because they put out all these supposed bin Laden, uh, you know, confession videos. And here he is supposedly, reportedly, admitting to having orchestrated the 9-11 attacks. So you've got Jay-Z a major asset of the system, you know, a major pawn, a major stooge yeah. of the entertainment industry, putting out his Blueprint album. And who uses Blueprints? What group uh, is involved with Blueprints? Well, that would be architects and engineers, would it not? So, you know, an interesting link there going through to 9-11. So he puts out this album on September 11th, 2001, and then the follow-up, The Blueprint 2, is on the 12th of November, 2002. So uh, some interesting numbers going on there it's always all about the numbers as you well know jason we know we know um that the that a lot of these artists do know that they, they i mean the, the amount of times that they, they say that they sold the soul to the devil they'll never get it back um the, the the amount of times they say things like that it's, it's quite clear that they know what the agenda is and 
they're they're acquiescing to it and and just doing as they're told. Is that what you think, or do you think that there's some that they're they're a bit more sinister than that? I think most of these artists are doing what they're told. It's become very clear to me that you don't get into any kind of position of fame and fortune and celebrity without selling your soul to the devil, to use that phrase, which I think has a lot more uh, relevance to it than people give credit to. People think it's just a metaphor, but I think there's a very real sense in which these artists, and not just music artists, but Hollywood actors, politicians, business leaders, guys like Bill Gates, Richard Branson, you know, you could put all these guys in, in the same category. If anyone becomes a household name that everyone has heard of, then they've paid a price to get there. So they're either coming out of some long-running key bloodline, which is very important to these elite types. You know, you have these different bloodlines running through the generations and new generations of these bloodlines are put to use in prominent positions in the public eye. So some of them are put there as politicians. Some of them become musicians. Some of them become actors, television presenters and stuff. But so much of it is down to the bloodlines that these people come from. But there's also a provision there in the entertainment industry for individuals that don't come from one of these important bloodlines, but are still so hungry for success that they're pretty much willing to do anything for it. And so these people are then made an offer and invited to step up a few rungs of the ladder into the elite uh, levels of, of these clubs and they have to pay very heavy prices for it. So we hear about all these parties that they attend, all these rituals and all the hedonism and debauchery and probably much worse that goes on at them. But uh, I think it's fairly safe to say that nobody gets to these prominent positions without uh, you know, compromising themselves in very major ways. And so I think they're told what to do. In so many cases, they're instructed uh, and they just follow their instructions in exchange for their engineered careers. Yeah, yeah what something I've noticed recently um, is is comedians. Um, there's a lot of com- If you'd notice the, the comedians that are in this country, uh, the, the most famous ones, the ones that you see on TV all the time, they're always privately educated. They've always got some sort of uh, some sort of aristocratic background. I mean, for example, Jack Whitehall. Uh, the guy's about as funny as as uh, uh, well, I don't know. He's it's, it's not very funny. He's <laughs> as funny as plucking your pubes out one by one. I think that's I think that's uh, what I'd say. Um, but it, again, it, it is is that the you know we've got all these footlights people. You know, Rowan Atkinson, and, and I'm not tarring Rowan Atkinson in that brush because I've heard Rowan Atkinson speak, and he speaks really eloquently about about um, social issues and things like that. But you know, you've got Stephen Fry, Hugh Laurie, all these people that that have come from um, from privileged backgrounds um, and and sometimes aristocracy. Well, yeah, I mean Monty Python spring to mind when you when you mentioned that the Monty Python team came out of Oxford and Cambridge universities, and both those institutions figure majorly in social engineering agendas when it comes to culture creation and stuff like that. Uh, so much of it comes out of Oxford and Cambridge, so you've got to ask yourself how it was that these guys got themselves a prime time. BBC TV show back in 1969 to uh, put all their stuff out. And many of these other alternative comedians of the late 70s, early 80s, as you've said, come out of these same institutions, such as Stephen Fry and Rowan Atkinson. Let's not forget that Rowan Atkinson took part in the mega occult ritual that was the opening ceremony of the London 2012 Olympics. Mm -hmm. So he certainly played his part in that. And I would be suspicious of anyone that took part in that particular event. Uh, but yeah, just just taking it back to some of this 9-11 symbolism, which all indicates that these artists were instructed to put this stuff in by probably higher ups in the industry that were privy to knowledge as to what was going to come to pass, you know, on that day. Uh, just one more thing about Jay-Z. I mentioned two of his Blueprint albums. His third Blueprint album just happened to be released on the 11th of September 2009. So they couldn't leave it alone. And by 2009, a lot of people were starting to question the official version of what had happened in 2001. But they still felt that they could put out this album on the 11th of September uh, and risk, you know, making it so obvious that the whole thing was just steeped in numerology and ritual and stuff like that. There was a Buster Rhymes album 
which came out in 1996, and it had a track on it called Everything Remains Raw. And in the lyrics to it, he says, there's only five years left. And I remember when that came out, I puzzled over it and I thought, well, what's he talking about? Five years left till what? And if you count forward five years from 96 to 2001, could that be an indication of knowledge, you know, there of what was to come to pass? And he put out a couple of albums, Buster Rhymes in the late 90s, called When Disaster Strikes, an extinction level event. And on the sleeves to these albums, you've got these apocalyptic, uh, terrible, chaotic events going on with explosions everywhere. And again, at the time, I thought, what is Buster on? Why is he putting out all this crazy stuff on his albums? But again, it just appears to be foreshadowing what was known to be coming. Uh, let me see what else I've got here. Uh, just one other thing to do with Michael Jackson. I mentioned that blood on the dance floor sleeve earlier. I mean, it's very difficult to know how much truth there is to these stories. But there were, were stories that came out of certain celebrities that were supposed to be on flights on September 11th, 2001. Yep. And at the last minute, they stepped off the flights and, uh, you know, didn't travel. And as I say, a lot of this, I'm sure, has gone into myth and legend, and it's very difficult to establish what truth there is to it. But some of the names that you hear banded about, according to certain researchers, include the singer Patty Austin, uh, the actress and wife of the Backstreet Boy Brian Littrell. Her name was Leanne Littrell. Seth MacFarlane, the creator of Family Guy and American Dad. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure he emerged from the same kind of institutions as Matt Groening of The Simpsons and Michael Jackson. So it's said that Michael Jackson was due to be on a flight on September 11th, 2001, but was tipped off and, and didn't fly in the end. And the actor Mark Wahlberg is, is spoken of in that regard as well. So, you know, I don't know how much truth there is to that, but it's interesting that it's entered uh, the world of myth. One other video that's worth mentioning, which I uncovered quite recently, because in my upcoming book, I've got a section looking at symbolism going in that, that went into 1980s pop videos. So a lot has been said about some of the occult, Masonic, Kabbalistic symbolism that goes into videos from the likes of Katy Perry, Lady Gaga, Kesha, Britney Spears, Kanye West, Rihanna, Beyonce, Jay-Z, people like that, you know, contemporary current day artists. But I thought it'd be really interesting to go back to the 1980s, uh, which is a, a decade where a whole load of videos got shown on MTV for the first time. And I remember a lot of pop music from that decade very fondly. And I thought, wouldn't it be interesting to see if the same imagery cropped up in those videos way back then, now that I know what to look for? And would you believe it? All throughout the 1980s, we see exactly the same motifs and symbols and images being portrayed in the big pop videos of the time. I mean, the Masonic checkerboard black and white floors, you'd think there was no other design of flooring available in the 1980s because they just crop up everywhere. There are some videos that were actually filmed in Masonic temples and they make no bones about it. You've got the pillars there. You've got all the Masonic decor. You've got depictions of the, the compass going on. You've got so much symbolism pertaining to trauma-based mind control now that we know what to look for there. Things like shattered mirrors, uh, dolls with uh, limbs missing, teddy bears with arms ripped off and things like that. This is all symbolism that pertains to the broken innocence of childhood when kids are subjected to horrific trauma and it causes them to dissociate from reality. So you've got so many depictions of all these dream states and these altered uh, perceptions and multiple personality disorder and stuff like that all throughout these 80s pop videos. It's quite fascinating. So I've got a whole chapter on that coming. And I'm going to be doing some public talks next year showing some of the images and just letting people know what to look for. But the one to mention here is one of the videos that was done for the Depeche Mode song called Enjoy the Silence. So this came out in 1990. We're just out of the 80s into the, the very early part of 1990. There was an official video for the song. So I'm not talking about that one. I'm talking about an alternative video which was filmed at the very top of the South Tower of Manhattan's World Trade Center. And this was put out on French TV. So you've got the group performing uh, at the very top of the tower with the view of Manhattan down below. And there's one point where the singer Dave Garn sings the lyric, come crashing in into my little world. And the camera just kind of closes in on him as he says that. 
What an interesting lyric to be recited at the very top of one of the World Trade Center towers. And what would that be? 11 years before the events of that day. So there's so much to find. And there's a couple of other renderings of the date 11th of September, not 2001, but in previous years. And so I, I referenced a couple of these in my book. And there's a couple of Beatle related ones. So John Lennon first appeared on the Dick Cavett show on US TV on the 11th of September 1971 to premiere the film for his song Imagine. And then you've got the recording date for the song Glass Onion, which appeared on the White Album, which is given as the 11th of Sep September 1968. And I've also heard that John Lennon is supposed to have met Yoko Ono for the first time at the Indica Gallery in London on the 11th of September 1966. And then you've got all kind of tie-ins to the whole Paul McCartney replacement going on there when you get into that whole Beatles quagmire, uh, which is probably something for another day. But this date, 11th of September, just keeps on cropping up throughout history. So not only do you have all these pictorial symbolic representations of what was going to happen, but you've got all these kind of key events that appear to have happened on that date as well. Uh, one of the, including the, the wasn't the Pentagon built when they first put the the first spade in to build the Pentagon that was on the September 11th as well wasn't it well it wouldn't surprise me if it was we're going back to 1966 for that one so that would be 91166 if that's the case and uh, who would be too surprised to find that was the case but yeah going back to the very construction of the World Trade Center towers uh the ground was broken in 1966, as I said, and it took a, a number of years for them to be completed. But uh, if you take 1966 as the starting point, they would stand for 35 years before the events of September 11th, 2001. 1968 is given as the date when uh, the construction of one of the towers was completed. And it's very interesting to me that 1968 was the release year of that iconic movie from Stanley Kubrick, written in conjunction with Arthur C. Clarke, major insider and occultist and Freemason as well, 2001, A Space Odyssey. And I've always loved that movie. I've always found it fascinating and enigmatic, and I've watched it so many times and tried to puzzle over what it was trying to convey. And I've reached a point now where I really have to wonder whether there was some inside knowledge on the part of Kubrick and Arthur C. Clarke and those that produced that movie of what was going to happen 33 years into the future. So 1968, the film is released. 33 years, a very interesting number in Freemasonic circles, as I'm sure you know. Mm -hmm. Later, we get the events of September 11th, 2001. And of all the years that that futuristic story could have been set in, they chose 2001 for this major world-changing, epoch-shattering event. So, you know, uh, they could have chosen... That's even before the Twin Towers have been erected, isn't it? Well, it's round about the time that they've been constructed. So you get this movie coinciding pretty much with the construction of the towers. And then 33 years later, you get the events of 2001. And you've got this whole story, which is set in 2001, which is quite interesting to me. Mm. Yeah, they're, well, they're, certainly, uh, they're certainly consistent anyway, and um, it, it, they're leaving clues about for, for everybody. But do, do you think some of these clues are, are just um, a f false trail? Do you think they're laying false trails or, or just trying to keep us occupied? Because, I mean, the, the stuff that you're coming out with, the, the numerology and everything, it, it does take quite a lot to, to, to be able to take all that in. Well, it does. It does. And I think this comes down to the reason why they would bother doing this stuff in the first place, because people always ask the question, you know, why would they go to so much trouble to put all this imagery into album sleeves that came out 22 years before the event and in movies that were put out 10, 15, 20 years beforehand? And it goes back even further than that. I'll give you a couple of examples shortly of, you know, fr from decades ago, which appear to hint at pre-knowledge of what's going to happen on 9-11. But it comes down to why they do all this. And there are three main reasons that are always given for it. So according to which researcher or scholar or author you speak to, you might get different takes on why they do all this stuff. But there are three main reasons. And as far as I'm concerned, all of them have some plausibility. So the first one is people will say they give the subconscious mind these renderings of what they know is coming. 
So they'll show you in countless movies and TV shows and music videos and stuff depictions of aeroplanes crashing into these twin towers and causing these great, these explosions. And so the subliminal mind of the general public is soaking up this stuff all the time because the subconscious mind absorbs stuff that the conscious mind misses. The conscious mind is only capable of processing a limited amount of information at any given time. But the subconscious absorbs millions of pieces of information, we're told, per second. And it just kind of sits there below the threshold of, of the conscious mind. And certain parts of it get brought through into the conscious mind and certain parts of it get stored in the memory. And so, uh, you know, these researchers will tell you that when they give you these foreshadowings of the events that you're going to be told about on the 11th of September 2001, when the newscaster gets up there on that day and tells you the official narrative of what went on, what they want you to believe, the Wikipedia version of events, most people in the general public are likely to swallow what they're being told because there's already a familiarity with the narrative in their subconscious. They've got these pictorial symbolic representations of what they're being told. And when the conscious mind takes in the information from the news bulletin, the subconscious is, is sort of going, yeah, I already know about this. This sounds familiar to me. Mm -hmm. So they're counting on that dynamic taking place so that the official version of events is, is swallowed much more readily. And of course, in previous years, this would have been swallowed much more readily by many, many more people were it not for the fact that we now have these incredible opportunities available to us via the internet to do research and to share information. And I really do wonder whether they underestimated the power of the internet in terms of us, you know, the unwashed masses, the, the, uh, the goyim, the, the regular uh, classes, being able to piece all this stuff together and, and, and figure it all out in ways that we weren't able to in previous decades. So that's one reason that's given for it. It's creating a, a familiarity with the official narrative before it comes. So then the second version is a lot of people will tell you that there's an energetic connection that's being made on an unseen level with the events that take place when you get these little depictions of it. So when you watch a movie and you see some aspect of 9-11 uh, in the storyline, you're unwittingly, unknowingly making an energetic connection with it because you're absorbing that imagery. You're taking it into yourself and you're creating a two-way exchange. So you're absorbing that imagery, but you're also giving your energy back to it in terms of your attention. So you get the phrase, energy goes where attention flows. And the idea is that you somehow empower these events into physical manifestation. You know, it's a form of magic, magic with a K, basically, which is another of the belief systems of these occult practitioners. The idea that if you get a large number of people focusing their attention on something, you can actually help to manifest it into being. You know, Alistair Crowley spoke of uh, magic being the art of causing change to occur in conformity with will. And will goes hand in hand with intent. So even though most of these people watching these music videos and TV shows and cartoons and stuff wouldn't have a conscious understanding of what it is they're connecting with, nevertheless, they're making that energetic connection and they're helping to bring it into play in line with the intent of the practitioners that brought it about. You know, that's, that's a complex one for people to wrap their heads around but it does make a certain amount of sense to me but the third reason that's given for predictive programming being put out there is the one that holds the most water for me and i think is the key to it all and that is that you are uh, kind of giving the masses an opportunity to understand what it is you plan to do so you're kind of announcing it you're making your intentions known but, of course, you're doing it in a very cryptic, encoded way that most people could never be reasonably expected to understand. You'd have to be very well versed in occult symbology and numerology and all these uh, mystery school teachings to properly be able to interpret what all these uh, depictions were trying to tell us. But it comes down to free will consciousness, which I think I probably spoke about on the last show. I got into it in my book as well. And these uh, elite, occult, religious, priest-class practitioners 
seem to understand that the way karmic law works, there are consequences for you if you uh, take away somebody else's rights or if you commit some kind of uh, wrongdoing against them. Like karma. Yeah, against their will, like karma. Mm -hmm. And they seem to feel that they can cheat this dynamic, this process, by announcing their intentions in advance and letting us know what it is they're all about and their true nature and what's in their plans. And so by putting all these images into these movies and these music videos and stuff for years and decades before 2001, they were preparing us for what was coming and, as they see it, giving us an opportunity to understand and when we didn't, in our mass numbers, voice any kind of objection to it and say, you can't do this, we're not happy with it, they took that as a green light to go right ahead and do it. Yeah. So, yes, it's a sick, twisted, distorted way of looking at it, but we mustn't forget that what we're talking about here is some very mentally imbalanced, sick individuals. You know, these people aren't well. These people belong in straitjackets in institutions for the rest of their days at very best. You know? I, think that, I think that's one of the stumbling blocks as well, is, is that, that people cannot, cannot comprehend that these people would do this. They think that these people think like they do, you know, have compassion, have, uh, you know, uh, some, some goodness in them. Whereas, whereas they don't, I think that's one of the biggest hurdles for people to get over. You know, like we were talking about earlier on, that that um, you you try to you try to get people to wait. To, I, I hate that saying, wake up, but it, for for the uh, loss of a, a, a better phrase. But it, you know, it, it, the amount of times I've said something to somebody, and they've just gone, ah, they'd never do that to their own people. Oh, they never, you know. Oh, they won't. And it's it's that sort of it's that it's like they've got us. They've got most people fooled. Yeah. Well, I think they're counting on that. They're counting on that kind of reaction for regular folk to say, uh, "Oh, they'd never do that." And what people mean when they say that is, "I'd never do that." We'd never do that. You know, regular people would not be capable of committing those kind of atrocities against others. But we're talking mm. about. Uh, psychopathic individuals very mentally unstable and they've been through all kinds of trauma themselves you know uh, not only is mind control programming rampant in the entertainment industry and in other walks of life in terms of they'll take artists like for example Nicki Minaj or Miley Cyrus or Britney Spears or Kanye West and so many of these other obvious examples of individuals that have been mind controlled into conformity and you can go to the world of Hollywood and look at people like Tom Cruise, who I'm sure is, is a mind control victim. You know, you can just see it in his behaviours. Uh, but they don't just reserve that kind of treatment for celebrities and those they wish to manipulate into these public positions. They're traumatising their own kids, these elite bloodline families. That's what we're talking about, you know. Uh, they actually put their own children through these horrors at a very young age to cause them to become psychopathic and narcissistic and to dissociate from uh, reality in so many ways and to just get completely out of touch with their humanity, with their innate spirituality. That's what prevents the rest of us from committing these kind of acts against others. Compassion, empathy, the full range of human emotions which we're born with, which is our natural state. What they do to ensure the continuation of their agenda is to make sure their own kind are devoid of these characteristics. So that's why they become capable of uh, this type of behaviour. I mean, who were the world leaders that presided over these events? Tony Blair and George Bush Jr. And if we're talking about mentally ill, sick, psychopathic individuals, you know, you can't really get two better examples. Tony Blair just speaks for himself. What he is is true nature. You've only got to look into his eyes to see the psychopathy there. And then George Bush Jr., you know, when he was governor of Texas before he took on the presidency, he was notorious for putting uh, prisoners on death row uh, to, you know, to the electric chair. He had such a track record of executions that surpass any of his, his peers, you know, and he used to gloat over it. There was an interview that I, I saw him in 
where he was talking about this one particular woman prisoner that he sent to uh, her execution. And she was begging him for her life. And she was sort of breaking down and wailing and saying, please don't execute me. And he's taking the piss out of her as he relates the story. He's mocking her. You know, what kind of regular individual with all their emotions intact would be capable of that kind of thing? So that's the mindset of, of the people we've got here. And we, need, we should never lose sight of that. So, yeah, regular members of the public who've not looked into this stuff and don't have an understanding of the, the true nature of those that are sadly ruling over us will say things like they would never do that. They'd also, unfortunately, say things like if they did, the BBC would tell us about it. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, they're living under this notion that uh, governments are basically there to help us and to protect us. And they're full of nice people that just want to make our lives better. And the BBC is all about telling us what's going on in the world to help us. They just want to tell us the truth. And of course, I'm sure anyone listening to your show understands that the situation we've got is the exact mirror image reversal of that. Governments are not here to keep us safe. They're here to do us harm. They're here to control and manipulate us in line with the agendas of those that really control them and really own them, which would be these cartels of banksters and oligarchs and you know occultists. And the BBC are there to spin propaganda and mind control. They're certainly not there to tell you the truth. They're there to perpetuate the official version of events that the elite ruling class want everyone believing. Unfortunately, they've done a great job of it because there's still a whole load of people out there that turn on the BBC evening news every night thinking that they're being told the truth about what's really going on in the world. But, uh, you know, just getting back to this whole predictive programming thing, I think a really useful way of getting people to look at the issue of 9-11 with fresh eyes if they've not done so already. So we're talking about the people that I referenced at the start of the show that you can hear in the pub and in supermarket queues and stuff still buying the official line of 9-11. A really good way, I feel, to engage them in a conversation that's really going to open their minds and make them question what it is they've been told all these years about what really went on, is to raise some of this stuff about the predictive programming imagery. Because, like I said, who really is going to chalk all this stuff as, up as coincidence? Even if you could chalk one of them up as coincidence. Let's take the super trap sleeve, for example. There will probably be people that will say, oh, you can apply anything to it if you want. If you want to make it fit the 9-11 narrative, you can say, yeah, breakfast in America and it's over Manhattan. And you could say it looks like a 9 and 11 over the Twin Towers. But I don't buy that one. OK, well, if you don't buy that one, then how do you explain the coup sleeve where you've got the, the Twin Towers exploding there? And if you don't buy both of those, then how do you explain the symbology in the Die Hard movie? and Independence Day, and how do you explain uh, Neo's passport in The Matrix? Having an and, and, and the Long Gunman as well, the Long Gunman episode that yeah, uh, yeah. did March. Yeah, yeah, the Long Kiss Goodnight as well. It's in so many movies. Uh, I've got a composite here. Uh, the Long Gunman, yep, Seven Days, Pinball Wizard, Godzilla, Trading Places, going back to 1983, Super Mario. That, that's Brothers. interesting because that uh, it wasn't Trading Places. Didn't have that. Aaron Russo was a producer on that, and he he did, yeah. make, did do an interview, didn't he? After, um, just before his death, um, where he he said that he'd been speaking to a Rothschild and they'd been telling him that we we're going to chip everybody and all that sort of thing. Yeah, it was a Rockefeller, Nick Rockefeller. So Rockefeller. Aaron Russo said that he was in this uh, meeting with Nick Rockefeller, and he was basically invited to step up into the elite ranks. He said Rockefeller um, told him what was going to come to pass on 9-11. And um, he said, you know, you, you can join our ranks. We think we, we'd like you among us. And Russo was horrified by this and wanted no part in it. And he was like, no, you're all right, mate. Thanks anyway. And then uh, a short while later, he dies in very suspicious circumstances, very suddenly. Go figure. Yeah. Mm. There's, there's another piece of 9-11 predictive programming that I just wanted to mention going back to 1967. And it's the cover of Time magazine. And it's got David Rockefeller. So we're back to another Rockefeller. I'm sure everyone was really sad when poor old David Rockefeller passed away at the age of 101 earlier this year. You know, a great loss. I'm still mourning uh, 
Yeah, well, and it's a big new Brzezinski, you know, very sad news. But anyway, uh, we're going back to 1967, and there was this cover of Time magazine, and you've got David Rockefeller on it, relatively youthful. I think he was in his 50s then. And um, he's sitting in this office window, and outside you can see construction of the World Trade Center Towers, which is already underway at the time of this photo shoot in 1967. And he's got his wristwatch on display very prominently. His sleeve is sort of up so you can see his wristwatch. And if you zoom in on the time that is displayed on his wristwatch, would you believe it? It just happens to be 9-11. <laughs> and if we're talking about decades past, let me just get another one up here. Uh, there's another sleeve I should mention, actually. Def Leopard. Oh, mania. If people Google the image sleeve to Def Leopard Pyromania, then they'll find something very interesting. I'll leave people to do that. But there's a book cover that I wanted to mention. Uh, if I can just find it here. Uh, I can't actually find it, but uh, it's a, a pulp novel from 1958. And I'm sorry, I can't remember the title and I can't get the image at the moment, but uh, maybe we could mention it afterwards. Uh, it's the cover to this book that came out in 1958. And you've got uh, a clock face on the cover. And there are two jet aeroplanes taking the place of the hands on the clock. And one of these jet aeroplanes is pointing to a nine and one of them is pointing to an 11. And this is 1958. So this is 43 years before the events of 9-11. And again, people might say that's a coincidence. And if they do, don't really know what to tell them, to be honest. I think you should be watching Jonathan Ross or something or watching EastEnders because this ain't the show for you. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I was, I was getting round to saying that I think if you presented the average person with all this information and get them to look at the visuals, actually get them to look at that Super Tramp sleeve, get them to look at the coup sleeve, get them to look at Michael Jackson sleeve, get them to look at all these uh, movie depictions that there are and there are so many videos on youtube if you just google uh, or if you just do a search on youtube for 9 11 predictive programming you'll find so many aspects of it in movies and stuff and these videos go on go on for minutes and minutes and minutes because there are so many examples that have been uncovered then the average person i think is going to see that there's something to it you've got to be in a very heavy state of cement headed denial not to acknowledge that something's going on. So this is a conversation I can see people being able to have with a friend that has come over for a coffee or with the guys down the pub or with somebody at work. If you present somebody with this information, even if they're not a truther in inverted commas or a conspiracy theorist in inverted commas, you know, if they've never really looked at truth type issues before, if you can sit them down and have a chat with them about all this stuff, who is going to deny that there's something very strange going on here and that it certainly seems to hint at the complicity of those that control the entertainment industries with those that really pulled off the events of 9-11? You know, if it really was bin Laden in a cave in Afghanistan with his dialysis machine hooked up next to his laptop, you know, and, and a good Wi-Fi signal up in the caves of Tora Bora. And if it really was Mohammed Atta and his mates with their box cutters, you know, after they've been partying with strippers with Jack Daniels and cocaine everywhere, uh, you know, if that really is what happened, then how is it that we get this in Independence Day and The Matrix and uh, Simpsons? You know, how is that? How is that possible? Multiple coincidences all over the place. Well, I mean, you know, let's, let's be honest here, Jason. It's not, is it? The, the odds of all that being a coincidence would be what? Billions upon billions to one? Yeah. I'd love a mathematician or a number cruncher to, to actually work out what the odds are of this just happening at random. Well, it, it's, it's the same thing as, sorry, it's the same thing as uh, you, you hear this idea of a, a hurricane blowing through a junkyard and it just happens to assemble a fully functioning jet aeroplane by you know, blowing all the bits together and assembling them all completely at random. <laughs> the odds of that happening are so slim that they're probably on a par with the odds of all these aspects of 9-11 being in all these movies and stuff and it just being a coincidence. I really don't know what more to say about it. Well, uh, anyway, I just want to say some uh, 
read out some of the messages that we've had in the chat room. We're, we're almost at the end uh, now. I know you've got to rush off. It's a, oh, you're obviously very, very busy. Um, yeah, it's all right, man. <laughs> on today. Um, we've got uh, Unique Lee has asked me to ask you to pop over his, to his channel and take a look at some of his videos. It's pretty much what he's, what you were describing, using movies and media to show the agenda. So I'll send you the, the link to that's in the chat room anyway on this, on this Skype call. Uh, the system's been prepping you for 1984 reality, for 1984, but they're a bit late, and over time, by about 33 years, which is interesting, it's 33 years since 1984. 33 uh, years, yeah. Which is interesting. Um, and uniquely, as put, there is another uh, plausible explanation, rather than slating celebrity children, sorry, rather than stating all celebrity children are abused, but it's still a cult. Um, and... In the chat room, we've got uh, we've got somebody who's uh, Pat. I think it's I think it's Pat who's in the chat room, but he's got an anonymous um, an, an anonymous username, and he's it's a not it's picked at random when you when you come on anonymously, it just comes on it picks a number at random, and he's an anon nine one one nine, which is interesting, and he says that all his uh, family think that he's a crazy tinfoil hat wearer. Well, yeah, I'm very sorry to hear that, but, <laughs> but if, he, if, he, if he were to show his family one of these videos, I mean, really, how can they still brush it off as nothing? I just don't understand how anyone can do that. They just Some people just won't look, though, will they? I mean, I know, I know my parents. I, when I have spoke to them, they, they, I gave them years and years ago, I gave them copies of Loose Change when that first came out, and... And I gave them copies of all different things, and they just wouldn't even look. That's that's the problem. You're getting if people are too comfortable, they don't want their they don't want their little bubble to to uh, to not be what they think it is. Yeah, well, that must be it. I mean, you know, I, I just struggle to get inside that mindset so much. People that will deliberately not look at something because they think it would put them in an uncomfortable place. I'm just someone that always wants to know the truth. It's very difficult for me to relate to people that probably know there's something to be discovered there, but they would deliberately not look at it because they think they won't like what they'll see. Mm. You know, that, that must be the explanation for why some people still refuse to acknowledge this is real. Mm. Right, anyway, we've got a couple of minutes to go. We're nearly at the end. Why, why don't you, have you got any links? Well, you, I know you've got links, so give, give out some links from where people can buy your book and, uh, and all your various websites and uh, your podcasts and that sort of thing. Sure. Well, uh, the main website is markdevlin.co.uk. I've just started a new Spreaker account, which is where I host my Good Vibrations conversation-based podcasts and the Sound of Freedom Conscious Music podcast. Uh, if you just look for Mark Devlin on Spreaker or there's links direct through from the main website to uh, all my shows there. On YouTube, I've got a bunch of videos up and actually all my recent radio interviews are now on YouTube as well. And that's youtube.com slash Mark Devlin TV. The book is out, Musical Truth 1. It's available on Amazon. There's a paperback version, a hardback version and a Kindle version. Uh, if people don't like Amazon and don't want to get it that way, but do want to get a copy of the book, they're welcome to email me. And if they can pay by PayPal, then I can mail out a signed copy. I'm very happy to do that. And that always benefits an author more than going through Amazon. So if people just want to email me at mark at markdevlin.co.uk, then we can make that happen. The new book, Musical Truth Volume 2, is going to be out early in the new year, probably late January. And, yeah, time flies. Jason, I just want to thank you for getting me on the show again. And I'll be very happy to come back on when the new book is out and share a whole bunch of the information that's in that because there's so many new stories that uh, I'll be happy to put out there. Brilliant. Thank you very much for coming on, uh, for agreeing to come on in your busy schedule. I, uh, we've uh, cut this down to an hour uh, so that you can have a bit of quality time with the wife as well. So uh, I, I understand that you're very busy. So thanks very much for coming on, Mark. And uh, we'll have you back whenever you want. If you just give us a give us a drop us an email when you want to come on, and I'll uh, I'll I'll, make, I'll keep a look out for your new book being released, and we'll uh, we'll have you on in January or February when when it's when it's out. So anyway, thank you very much, everybody listening to Raconteurs 2. I'm Jason Holmes. I'm reminding you that this world is 
for everybody and not just for Aid Hardy. Uh, tomorrow night I'm back. I've got Bedge on, Ben Emling Jones. It should be a cracking show. We're talking UFOs and that sort of thing. Um, it's always good value, Bedge. And uh, next Monday, I've got Neil Sanders. Now, he sent me his book, uh, a copy of his book. And it's absolutely huge. So I've got a lot of reading to do in the next week before I, before I get Neil Sanders onto the show. Uh, but thanks for listening. I'll be back on tomorrow from 8 till 10 with Ben Emlyn Jones on Raconteurs News. This is Raconteurs 2. We'll see you again soon. Bye. Get the wiggies cause I'm off to the hole in the road I'm walking off school and I'm off to the city Watching telly all night and I'm not looking pretty See I got this job downtown Selling knocked off ladies watches for a pound For a really dodgy man that I met in a dodgy cafe You know he said to me The girl who sold these yesterday Wasn't selling very carefully Police came along and took her and all my watches away So if you see some cameras you grab my stuff and leg it boy Right away I'll be in the cafe I'm just a boy from Sheffield Making his way Through life I'm just a boy from Sheffield Making his way I'm just a boy from Sheffield Making his way Through life I'm just a boy from Sheffield Making his way So it's been a few hours and I haven't sold enough For my bus fare home street sale is pretty tough So I turn on the charm for the lunchtime rush With a smile and a wiggle on my schoolboy touch Well the charm is working in the underground There's a crowd of men and women gather round And the watches they are going The money is a flow. Think I'll a little extra Stick it in my pocket Spend you later I'm just a boy from Sheffield Making his way Through life I'm just a boy from From Sheffield, making his way through life. I'm just a boy from Sheffield, making his way. I haven't sold a watch for an hour, and I'm dying for a slash. I've had enough of this, so I'm off for a piss. Then a quick walk back round to the cafe. Sitting at his table, drinking tea. Looks at me suspiciously. Then, with a glance at the watch, he says, How did you do? Then he said, would you like to come and work another day? I said I'd come back down on Friday And to that he said, okay So with two pounds in my pocket And another five in my shoe I nipped down to Castle Market Where a man who looks like Leo said He's selling pots with cockles and prawns You make me feel like dancing Then off back to dinner on the Wiggers and then home I'm just a boy from Sheffield Making his way I'm just a boy from Sheffield I'm just a